in the ultimate social experiment, the public is invited to join in an open mind discussion. The goal is to give voice to the common man, without prejudice, and just like in real life, if you want to talk, you show your face. Will they discuss on geopolitics, economics, military topics, or current affairs? Or will this just become yet another Twitter shit show? In an ultimate test of free speech and free expression, I present to you the DPA Open Mic. So in the DPA Open Mic 33, we start off with you know, the discussion uh, over the, you know, the biggest thing that happened over the past week as per the Open Mic. What's the Ukrainian offensive? Hi, offensive? What offensive? If they had air cover and more artillery, that'd be a tight little assault package. But, you know, they're sending them in minefields and they're basically getting ambushed. I mean, I don't want to get into a whole lot of it, but I mean, there seems to me like they're they're going down terrain that favors the Russians. Um, I, I think that if, if in a, imagine a, a world where they go and they do do take Melitopol and then they do destroy the Kerch Bridge again, right? And they fully destroy it this time. In a case like that, I think that the Russians are going to be pretty interested in negotiating or certainly more interested in negotiating than they are now. Alternatively, they might just get angrier and uh, escalate the conflict further, but that seems like the logical strategy for me. I didn't think about Divka like that though. That is an option. One of the biggest contentious points that was being talked about is the Kahovka Dam destruction. Thanks to the dam being gone, it now is an attack vector and that benefits the stronger side, which is the Russians. With it there as a threat that either side could use, it was really more to the Ukrainians' benefit. What about when the world knows if it is true, we, I don't know, nobody really can sh say for sure, that Ukraine destroyed that dam. But if Ukraine did it, if someone can prove it somewhere right or wrong, uh, now or later, it's a, it's a really, it's a blow on all the Ukrainian narrative. They did something so reckless to get some objectives. I, I think that most of the world that's not committed to this war will say we are free now. We can say no. Our yeah. moral stand goes, we are not with this shit. We are fed up. Then came this very controversial idea that this war will end up with Ukraine being more Russian than ever before, and someone else will be raising your children. So one, some American said that someone else will raise your children. Um, and I think about this war because so many uh, Ukrainian men will die that when Russia comes and settles this land, ethnically, blood Russians will take over Ukraine, whether they want it or not. So they've literally effed themselves. The Ukrainians, by sending all their military aged men, have bred themselves out of the equation. And we're not talking about like a small dent, we're talking about an entire and an entire generation and perhaps two generations of men will die in this war and that will outbreathe themselves so i mean i also don't understand them saying that uh, okay the, the ukrainian men die and the women and the children will become russian it's not so easy Dam. the respect for the russians i didn't say that by the way prada i didn't say that by I the way know, i said I that term. okay I know, I and don't say what i said that. I know, I expect you to clarify that because that might be a misunderstanding. And then there is this you know, intriguing you know, concept that every civil war breeds a powerful country. Um, I think the smarter people in general are leaving Ukraine, I think. Um, but uh, the real big point I want to make and maybe bring it back to the military realm is that if we look at this as a civil war, of people who are really the same but are taking two ideological stances which is the way i think dan just said it and i think the way i feel about it um then militarily do civil wars result when they end 
in a tougher opponent or country or a, a weaker one. I mean, Vietnam fought a civil war, ended up very tough at the end. Korea fought a civil war. They're still in a frozen conflict. Both sides of that conflict are very, very tough today. The American Civil War, after that ended, they incorporated the Confederate veterans and they went all the way to the West Coast and, and took and then further all the way over the Pacific. So they got tougher. I mean, you show me a civil war and I'll show you a population with a huge number of combat trained veterans who are tough as hell. The mine clearing tank that is leading the line seems to not work when air support is not present. Like I was on the tanks, the way, the way I see it would have done is we would have moved up and like supported the combat, you know, the combat engineers and they would have had vehicles. They would have rolled up with a Miklik charge, fired that out, cleared a lane. Then we probably would have had tanks with the blades on them and the plows go in front to protect the engineers as they planted flags and marked the lane to move through. But I mean, that's all why you have complete air superiority. No one's bombing you, no one's shooting missiles at you, no one's dropping artillery on you. Yeah. Um, the lack of MiG clicks, the, ma the lack of combat engineers in NATO, uh, you don't put armor in front of men. Usually there's this amount of combat engineers on the floor sweeping. I mean, I was in front of uh, light armored vehicles in Afghanistan. I was in front of MRAPs. I was in front of buffaloes, which actually clear mines. The Marine Corps puts men in front of armor. Why? Because it's more effective. But there was none of that. There was no MIG lakes. There was no APOPs. There was no anything for clearing anything to actually push forward. Forget about the air. Forget about the artillery. Even the most sim the simplest of things to advance a uh, armored vehicle. There's no open avenue of approach. So, if there's no line charge, why are you moving these forces towards a, a, a tree line? And then we went into some long discussion about Russian change of battle concepts you know they went from the btg the bat uh, battalion tactical groups into divisional setup russians first of all are always modifying their forces just because they went into mobile tactical groups where the command was actually at where they were actually making the change decisions to change on the battlefield mostly is it was they went to the mtgs but it it reflects the type of fighting they do. If you read about it in the uh, the, the Russian way of war, is that they there's nothing to prevent them from flowing through these objects, getting enough room where between these units to maneuver, and then they go back into a mobile battle group 20, 20 miles wide, 60 miles deep, like a lawnmower. There's nothing. That's that's why this really uh, this this Ukrainian offense just. It, it, it kind of drives me crazy because they ain't, if, if they use their reserve to be able to, to fortify failure in what was once known as Bakhmut and then trying these PR attacks, there's nothing to stop the Russians to just forming up like that and moving forward. Then we went into this discussion into the myth of nuclear weapons and how Russia will eventually just get more and more aggressive. The Russian government is telling its people and has been for quite some time that NATO has attacked Russia and Russia is in a war with NATO. Now, the Baltic states don't hear that, right? They should, because they're in NATO, right? And so if Russia is saying we are in a war with NATO, what Russia is saying is we are in a war with the Baltic states. It might not have turned hot on that front, but that's what the Russian government are telling their people. And uh, now, again, the, 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 the position in the Baltic states is Russia will never attack us because NATO has got nuclear weapons. But what I want you to think about is this. NATO would never have gone into Ukraine in 2014 and, and performed a military coup. Do you know why? Because Russia has got nuclear weapons. And that was just a taste of what the DPA Open Mic is about, especially for this episode 33. Uh, this is not everything that was uh, being discussed uh, within the Open Mic. It was uh, three hours long. Typically, we do five hours, and I was trying to do it shorter so that I can make this uh, video. But no, who knows? And uh, I would like to invite you guys to come on the DPA Open Mic, share your views. You no, know, if you do, you're shy. 
you know you can always just chat within the live chat with other like-minded individuals and uh, let's grow the dpa open mic bring the voice to the people it's free speech the free expression of opinions of thoughts of feelings and perhaps we can also all you know learn something from one another uh, this is the most international podcast i believe uh, on youtube and around the world where this is the only place where you can actually see people uh, letting you know what is the exact situation about uh, in their country so that you do not get duped by the mainstream media or the fake news or the misinformation or the propaganda and uh, is there sanctions in a certain place are they really struggling with uh, electric you know, energy prices you can just ask them they are all they are people from all around the world that are very happy to share their feelings their experience with you and together we will be more informed and this is the dpa open mic <laughs>